We have a podcast. Diving, diving deep. deep. Diving deep into all things Texas. Both on and off the field. Here's Sean Pendergast. And Pro Football Hall of Famer, the General. Sean McClain. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Utopia. Um, and we are just a few hours removed from the Texans. 31-20 loss the Indianapolis Colts in the home opener. For the D'Amico Ryans era, just an all-around disappointing effort from the Texans today uh, in which they fell behind very early in this game and never were even at a point where they were remotely close to taking control of this football game in a game that they were favored coming into this game by one point. We're here to break it all down for you. General thoughts on the loss today, and then we'll do four stock up, four stock down, and get you ready for the upcoming week here on the Utopia Football Podcast. But John, as I welcome you in here, um, just a I mean, really, from very early on in this game, just a, to me, a completely disappointing, depressing performance from the Texans. And my biggest theme here is I, the honeymoon is now over for D'Amico Ryans and this coaching staff after that effort today. And really, the cumulative summary of these first two weeks of the season where the Texans lose by 16 last week to Baltimore and then 11 by 11 at home today in a game where they trailed 28 to 10 at the half to a team, the Colts, that are largely viewed as a team that's in the bottom quartile of the league just the I think just so many things inexcusable about this loss today as long as they have an offensive line it's the worst in franchise history they're not just playing backups they're playing third and fourth stringers guys that are lucky to be in the NFL they're not going to be able to run the ball they're not going to be able to play, uh, protect CJ Stroud who I thought was phenomenal under those circumstances and it's going to be ugly to me you know, I don't expect them to run when the offensive line's horrific. What I expect them to do is play good defense, stop the run, which they did against the Ravens. And today, I think they had solved Anthony Richardson's passing after he scored. You know, he had a 15-yard series, so you can't hold that against the defense after a strip, not a strip sack, but Stroud fumbled when he was sacked. Yeah, well, I guess that would be a strip sack. Anyway, he fumbled, and it was a 15-yard drive, but then they gave up three touchdown drives of 75, 76, and 75 yards, and that is inexcusable and not acceptable. And I think if Gardner Minshew, an experienced quarterback, hadn't come in and just – he was so accurate, he got rid of the ball so quick, I think they would have had a chance. But your defense can't play that bad. No sacks, no tackles for loss. The Colts had six sacks, 10 tackles for loss, nine quarterback hits. Texans only hit Richardson and Minshew one time. And it was such a disappointing performance by the defense that showed so much promise in that loss to the Ravens. Yeah, I um, I had said, John, in the pregame, and I said it during the week too, and I can't believe it came to fruition, but – I, I was actually, you know, as the as we were talking about the strategy throughout the week being, man, you got to hit Anthony Richardson. You got to hit him. You got to hit him. Every chance you get, you got to hit him. And I just got to thinking about, okay, what if we hit him so much he does get knocked out of the game? And I thought to myself, you know, I think there's a chance that in week two of Anthony Richardson's rookie season that Gardner Minshew actually gives the Colts a better chance to win this football game than Anthony Richardson does. Now, I know Anthony Richardson had the two touchdown runs. I'll be honest with you, I feel like as poorly played and as with as such low energy as the Texans were playing on those two plays, he was untouched until the very, very last yard of the second touchdown run. He was touched by nobody on those two touchdown runs. I feel like there's about 25 quarterbacks that could have run those in um, based on the energy level of the Texans defense. But my concern was, man, if you knock Anthony Richardson out of this game, I think Minshew might come in and actually do, make some throws that Richardson at this stage of his career cannot make. And that's actually what happened, John. You know, you I think you nailed it. They had they had figured they had kind of figured some things out with Anthony Richardson after that first drive, that long drive, that 75-yard drive that Richardson led them on that first touchdown. There was not a lot of good on that drive and Anthony Richardson was able to convert some third downs and get a touchdown. The one play for 15 yards after the turnover, that's not really a drive that you're gleaning any big picture stuff from. That was just a sudden change that the Colts called the right play on. Those next two series, they went three and out both times, and I thought that they had kind of figured some things out. And then in comes Minshew, and he goes touchdown, touchdown, field goal on those three drives. And to me, John, it wasn't just Minshew with the short passing game. Yes, the 
the run defense was against the, the conventional run defense last week against Baltimore, not the Lamar Jackson run defense, but against the Dobbinses and the Hills and the Gus Edwards of the world was, was actually very good statistically. Zach Moss, during those three drives, those three Gardner Minshew drives, I wrote it down, John. He had seven carries for 51 yards, and he was just churning out yardage. He was getting six yards, six yards, seven yards, 11 yards, five, six, ten. He didn't have a single carry that was under five yards. That really helped Gardner Minshew be able to operate because he's in second and five and second and three and third and two. And 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 so any chance to put pressure on Gardner Minshew in that situation was was a moot point because he's just boom, he's getting the ball out quick. There was the one huge mistake that the Texans made in coverage on that Mallory guy where he Minshew found him for 43 yards that completely flipped the field. So that was I, I thought I thought Richardson getting knocked out of the game today actually ended up being a detriment to the Texans because Minshew came in and just did exactly what the Colts needed from him. Uh, you mentioned about the yards that he was getting. A lot of that just showed how they're getting blown off the ball. Yeah. When you have no tackles for loss out of your lineman or anybody on your front seven, that's embarrassing. And especially when the Colts showed what happens when you hammer an offensive line. You get tackles for loss, you get sacks, and you get hits on the quarterback, and the Texans got none of that against the Colts' offensive line. I bet Chris Strasser – the new line coach for the Texans, wish she's back in Indy where okay. he has Nelson and Smith and Kelly healthy. Kelly went out in the game, I think, in the fourth quarter as a center, Ryan Kelly. Yeah. But it is amazing to me, Sean, no matter what the Texans have tried, investing in draft choices, free agents, trades, money, everything, and they still – Coaches, they still can't get their offensive line right, but at least they got excuses now, which are debilitating injuries. Uh, Laramie Tunsil is supposed to be back for the Jacksonville game. And then uh, Titus Howard and Juice Scruggs are supposed to be back after four weeks off injured reserve. And then the question is, who will play left guard? I'm guessing it ain't going to be Josh Jones because he's been terrible. And a guy to keep an eye on is Jared Patterson because he was a guard before he was moved to center. And I think he's done a good job at center for he's the third center they've had. And you don't see him getting steamrolled or committing stupid penalties like Josh Jones. So that, that whoever they put at left guard, I'm sure it ain't going to be Ken, Kendrick Green who made his start there today. But uh, I, I can't wait to see. But it won't surprise me if it's not Patterson. Yeah, I Patterson is certainly if if the goal is to get your five best guys out there, you know, unless until they get everybody everybody back, Patterson might be one of their five best guys even once they get Titus Howard back and and other solutions on the interior there and wing. And obviously Laramie is going to be your left tackle when he's healthy, so he doesn't factor into a got to get our best five out there. When he's out there, he's left tackle and you figure out the other four spots, I suppose. Um, but I, and we're going to get into four stock up and four stock down in a second. Some of it might end up being redundant because you and I are kind of laying out the recap of this thing, but John, my, 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 uh, overall theme coming into the post game show today and coming into this podcast, the honeymoon's over now for D'Amico Ryan's, you know, we, it's an zero and two start. This was an extremely winnable game in terms of the opponent. This was an energy level that we'd not seen at NRG Stadium in a long, long time, starting out in the parking lot with people tailgating very early today. We haven't seen that since before COVID, honestly. Um, and and so, so people are wanting to buy in. They're wanting to believe. the game. I don't know if the game was technically a sellout. It was a bit of a late-arriving crowd, but not as late-arriving as we've seen the last couple of years. And by the time the end of the first quarter, early second quarter rolled around, it was loud at times in there. Like, it was – this is a crowd that was trying to get back into this thing, and the Texans gave them, other than C.J. Stroud and Nico Collins, they gave them almost no reasons. And between the defense coming out looking unenergetic and confused against Anthony Richardson and, and, and not putting pressure on the passer, as you said, and then John offensively. Yeah, I know they've got a lot of injuries along the offensive line. I know they do. But Bobby Slowick does not have to keep calling running plays up the middle down 21 in the third quarter. John, they burned seven minutes and 20 seconds off the clock to kick a field goal to make it 31 to 13 early in the fourth quarter. That's inexcusable. Those are things the Bobby Slowick can't control the injuries, but he can control his decision making and identifying at a time in the game where you are desperate for points. It's 31 to 10, and the clock is against you now. You, we've been able to figure out seven quarters into the season kind of what this team does. I'll say, well, I don't know they do anything well, 
but we we've been able to figure out what they do better than other things. And one of the things they cannot do is run the football. Damian Pierce gets hit before, like at the line of scrimmage on virtually every single time he gets handed the football, that they were still handing the ball off in the middle of the third quarter and, and running it for one yard at second and nine, and then it's third and seven. And now you're asking a rookie quarterback on third and seven, an obvious passing down to convert third downs. And you know what? C.J. Stroud did. He was 9 of 19 on third down today. Bobby Slowick's play calling is inexcusable to me, John. Like, it's, as far – I am I am completely unimpressed with Bobby Slowick at this point. And, again, I know the injuries are not his fault, but his decision-making stinks as far as I'm concerned, as far as the play calling goes, as far as knowing what the situation is. It, 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 he is – as the offensive coordinator, he is responsible for the lack of urgency of this team getting in and out of the huddle – as is CJ, as are probably a few of the other leaders on this team. There were way too many times, John, today, way too many times that they're down by three touchdowns and, and they're running the play clock down to four seconds and three seconds because they can't get a play in or they can't get the play off. That's Bobby Slowick's responsibility. As far as I'm concerned, he is just some dude that worked for Kyle Shanahan at this point. There's nothing that impresses me about Bobby Slowick so far. Man, did you just waste a stock down. I, I needed that though, John. I need you. And if you want to, if you want to add to it, if you want to no, add to it and stock down, but John, I do feel better. I needed to get that off my chest because I am just unimpressed with Bobby Slowick so far. Well, good. That would have made a good stock down, but there's plenty to go around. <laughs> yeah, that is true. We don't have to worry. The buffet is full. All right. So I got that off my chest. John, along those lines, we'll get to stock up and stock down in a second. Uh, you look around this division now, and the Texans are the only team without a win. Colts won today, obviously, over the Texans. The Titans got a big upset win over the Chargers at home. And the Jacksonville Jaguars lost in a, an uncharacteristic defensive struggle in Kansas City today. So you look around the AFC South, and uh, the, the, tide is already, the, the tidal wave is already burying the Texans early in the season, John. They're right where they're supposed to be in last place. That's yeah. what they're accustomed to being in last place. And right now, I don't see them beating the Steelers. I don't see them beating the Jacksonville Jaguars. Can you imagine when Watt and Highsmith come in here, two great pass rushers, and they're, it's the last game before you come off IR, and mm -hmm. they're going against Josh Jones and George Fant? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. God. Yeah, brutal. Absolutely. They'll be brutal. handing the ball to Damian Pierce for third and one. I mean, for a lot of one yard runs just to keep Stroud from getting creamed. Yeah. Well, John, and the, look, the, you just mentioned the first four games. The next four games are all those NFC South teams that looked easy before the year. And look, it's only two games. So I'm not going to get too over the moon about it. Atlanta, 2 0. Oh. They play them in week five, the week after the Steeler game. They, Atlanta's 2 0 oh right now. And they're running the football down people's throats. They, they're 2-0, and it ain't because of Desmond Ritter. Bijan Robinson had 100-and-something yards today. You know, they've got Tyler Algier who can run the football too. And Tampa Bay, John, Baker, old Baker Mayfield has Tampa Bay. Now, granted, you know, it's uh, the, you know, the Vikings win was a nice win. They beat the Bears today. Nobody's throwing a parade for that. But those are two teams that I think you look at the schedule before the season, you go, oh, those are winnable games right there. Yeah, they're both 2-0 and to start the season now. Right now, they don't have any winnable, but they do have a legitimate franchise quarterback. So let's start there. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.